So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me, and my apologies for my lack of German, um, so I will have to speak in, in English. I was last in Steyr in 2003 when I visited a Handels Academy as part of a, a part of a project on different forms of VET across Europe. I was and remain fascinated by vocational education and training in this country, and particularly by the deep political and economic foundations on which it is built. Um, I would give you a piece of advice. Change it at your peril. Leave it alone. It's doing a good job. My topic today is moral education, but first I want to respond to uh, ideas I heard yesterday that we live in a world of unparalleled change. And excuse me for using my family to do this. So the little chap on the right-hand side is uh, Jacob Harry Robert Hayward, who's my grandson. Of course, he's the most beautiful, amazing child in the world. <laughs> the next picture is my son, Dan, with his son, then me, of course, and with his great-grandmother, who's my, my mum. Now, Jacob will enter the labor market in 2040, probably. What will the world be like? Everybody kind of does this at the moment. Oh, we can't possibly tell. I have to tell you, that is wrong. The, 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 the bonds of trust and love and respect that hold my family together, the things that make us humans will still be there in 2040. What will be different is the type of work that will be available. And the issue there is not about having to learn new things. Human beings are programmed to learn. That's what we're really good at. I have lived through my life through unprecedented change. And yet my job as a professor is fundamentally the same as it was in the Greek academies two and a half thousand years ago. The only difference is I use that thing. But I'm basically doing the same job. The real issue we face is about the quantity and quality of the jobs that will be available. And no amount of that will have an impact on that because that is the product of the competitive and product strategies that companies will pursue. And that is a social and political issue, not an educational one. So that's the point I wanted to make. I could do a whole hour's lecture on that, and perhaps you could invite me back next year and I'll do that one. <laughs> Furthermore, what that man was thinking two and a half thousand years ago is still true today. And that's what I'm going to talk about, about how do we develop citizens and the role of VET in doing that. Now my job means I get to go to lots and lots and lots of different places in the world. And everywhere I go, I hear this. It sounds really good when you hear it, but when you unpack it and think about it, what's being said is often deeply objectionable. And I just wonder what this man would say about education, education, education. I think he'd say nine, nine, nine. <laughs> because it's not Baruch and it's not Bildung. What the policymakers are talking about is that. They have reduced education to an economic commodity. If you like equations, there seems to be equations all over the place. That's the equation for those graphs. And of course, it's the famous Mincerian wage equation. And Jacob Mincer, if he was still alive, would have told you that's just one way of thinking about education. But the problem we have is that that, the rate of return to schooling, has become a fetish for policymakers. And they now equate the size of the rate of return to education to the quality of the education. And I'm afraid that is also wrong. The other type of discourse you hear is what this man was saying back in 2007, 
and that is about the role of education in equipping a flexible labor force. So you don't regulate the labor market. That's what he's saying here. Don't regulate the labor market. You have to allow employers, employ, employers to do whatever they like with the labor market. What you have to do is to create a reservoir of flexible employees who can um, gain their jobs and lose their jobs. This is neoliberal economics. I don't think education's about that either. Of course it's important that young people uh, get a job, and of course it's important they become in economically independent. Um, but education is far more than that. And that's what I want to talk about. So I am not denying that is the case. It really is important that young people have an education which enables them to get a job which they want to do and um, to earn a living. That's absolutely the case. I am saying that is totally wrong. There are things that happen on the internet that simply should not happen because they're morally indefensible. Absolutely morally indefensible. So what you're going to see now is a group of philosophers. Um, and I'm going to start with this philosopher, whose name is Martha Nussbaum, who's an American. And she would, she would thinking about that political discourse, she would use this wonderful American expression, you cannot be serious. And if you haven't read it, that book should be uh, mandatory reading for all educators, because that's what education is about, cultivating humanity. And that's what I want to talk about. Cultivating humanity somehow seems to have got lost in the increasingly instrumental policy discourse that surrounds us all. Right, now I have to do some uh, groundwork. Many of you will know this movie, I'm sure. Um, Bill Murray, Lost in Translation. Here he is in Japan, uh, completely jet-lagged, and he's arrived in a country where you can't read the signs because they're written in Japanese. And if you've ever been in that kind of context, you know how bewildering it is. So when I'm confronted by that word, I'm bewildered. And when I'm confronted by that word, I'm even more bewildered. Because there is no simple way to translate those into English. I was very relieved the other day, um, whilst we were having just one beer um, outside the hotel, to be told that Germans still argue ferociously about the meaning of Bildung. So I'm really happy to hear that. So I have to do some translation work because I have to work with these words in English, but there is no simple one-to-one -one correspondence. When I was having things translated to me yesterday um, during the talks, Bildung was being translated as education, but it's far more than that. It's much more complicated. So I'm going to start with this man. All right, so this is another great American philosopher, John Dewey. And Baruf, I think, is captured by him really well in this book, Democracy in Education. And all of my PhD students have to read that book as soon as they arrive in Cambridge. That's the first thing they have to read. Now, he wrote that seminal work when he had moved to New York, but it was actually born in Chicago. And Chicago... At that time, so we're talking the turn of the 19th and 20th century, so he's there from about 1896 through to about 1910. Um, the city was growing rapidly. It was undergoing profound industrial change and striving to integrate migrants, ironically, primarily from Europe. Dewey really does speak directly to our modern world, even though he wrote that book over 100 years ago. So what does Dewey say? He says this, and I am going to read this out. A vocation means nothing but such a direction of life activities as render them perceptively significant to a person because of the consequences they accomplish and also useful to his associates. Now, Dewey is not the greatest writer in the world. If he can use five words rather than one, he will. <laughs> right? 
But that kind of captures the essence, I think, of the notion of vocation. It's that which gives you a direction in life. The opposite of a career is neither leisure nor culture, but aimlessness, capriciousness, the absence of cumulative achievements in experience on the personal side, and idle display, parasitic dependence upon the others on the social side. And Baruf, for me, has this double meaning. It's both about the individual, but it's also about the society. And it's about that which gives you a direction in life. I think that captures the essence of Baruf. So that's what I'm going to take for Baruf. Bildung help. I have spent a whole month trying to understand this word. I have undertaken a genealogy of it, which means I've traced it back as far as I possibly can. Um, and it seems to appear in the 16th century in pietistic theology in Germany. And the idea is that it requires the devout Christian to cultivate their talents and dispositions according to the image of God, which was innate in their soul. The idea of a development or unfolding of certain potentialities within the human seems to be key to the concept of building. It's that, got that sort of notion of development. Uh, we can follow its development through that series of dead white men, I'm sorry to say, um, but you will recognize all of those, I am sure. And Dewey was very heavily influenced by Hegel. And you will find Bildung in Dewey's work because Dewey talks about education as growth. And I think that concept of growth is central to the concept of Bildung. So here is my stab at trying to interpret in English what Bildung means. You can give me marks out of 10. I've probably got it wrong. Um, it certainly is not yet finished, but this is my attempt. So it's about self-formation or realization of an individual whose conduct is governed by a highly developed inner character, not by imitating the conduct of others. So that's about independence. It involves the identification and development of one's talents through education and experience, finding a vocation which contributes to your growth and maturation and the society in which you live. Again, you get that double, individual and social, which I think is really important. It involves a transition from inwardness to outwardness and the development of a fully rounded personality. And this involves learning, and this is Hegel, I just love this. It involves learning that is a passionate search for truth, self-knowledge, which is arduous and requires the exercise of responsibility. So that's as far as I've got in of just over a month. It's quite hard work to actually understand the concept of, of building, and I'm going to carry on doing it. The second bullet point I think is really important because of that word vocation which seems to link, for me at least, Bildung to Beruf, um, which of course is the theme of the conference. So to try and summarize all of that, I think Beruf is a process of formation, an ongoing process of both personal maturation as one pursues the vocations of life. And there is more than one vocation in all of our lives. We tend to think about vocation in relationship to work, but there's also the vocation of being a citizen and the vocation of being a parent and all sorts of other vocations as well. And vocational education and training has to attend to those vocations. Bildung, I think, is more like an outcome or a tradition or an ideal that you're trying to aim for. Uh, so Bildung is commensurate with Dewey's conception of a vocation which leads us back to Baruf. So vocational education, and I stress education, needs to embrace both Baruf and Bildung. So, given that, what are the purposes of VET? Now I'm concerned primarily with young people, 16 to 21 year olds, perhaps 14 to 21 in some countries, because I believe as a society we have a moral responsibility to the welfare of those young people. So I think VET's got four um, key priorities. 
first is to provide the knowledge and skills needed to pursue competently the multiple vocations of life, work, parenting, being a citizen. Secondly, I think we have to provide young people with an education. I don't like the word training. You train your dog. You educate people. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> you provide an education that will enable young people to adapt as the economic base of society changes. And that's a really interesting discussion. And again, another lecture. So perhaps the year after, you'll invite me back to do that one. You have to develop the capability to live intelligently and pursue a life worth living as a citizen participating in a society, not just a worker. And later on, I'm going to argue that the word competence does not do justice to that concept. And finally, it has to enable us to become more human. Remember Martha Nussbaum, the purpose of education is to cultivate humanity. So what do I mean by becoming more human? So I'm going to use a German philosopher again here, except she left Germany and went to live in the United States. And that is Hannah Arendt. Now what education does is it improves our capacity to think and to reason. And what Anna Arendt is saying in the quote I'm about to show you is about the nature of that thought. She says, the manifestation of thought is not knowledge, but the ability to tell right from wrong, beautiful from ugly. And I hope that thinking gives people the strength to prevent catastrophes in these rare moments when the chips are down. So when the chips are down is on a roulette table, it's when you're really thinking about the hard things in life. Can you remember when the chips are down? Because we're going to come back to that in a second. Okay. So that's the philosophical bit. Now the practical bit. What should we teach and how if we want to make young people more human? which I think is the key purpose of any education, general and vocational. Well, one way to think about it, and this is the way we increasingly think about education, is we write lists. So we write lists of rules and practices essential to social survival, and we call them social competencies or transversal competencies and think we've done something really profound because we've attached a label which nobody really understands the meaning of to a set of things that we're trying to do. I'm going to have a real go at the concept of competence in a minute. Okay? What we then do is we shape behavior so it conforms to those rules. And we do that through systematic instruction, preaching, and modeling with positive reinforcement. Don't do that, do that. Do what I do, not what, that, not what you're doing. In order to achieve that, you have to have a controlled social environment designed to encourage cooperative and socially useful forms of behavior. That, of course, is what Skinner was describing in, I think, the most frightening book I have ever read, which is called Walden Two. Um, in which he provides a prescription for the formation of human beings using his uh, operant reinforcement. It is truly terrifying. And Uri Bronfenbrenner describes that system um, as underpinning um, child and moral education in the Soviet Union in, the, in a book he wrote in the 1970s called uh, Two Types of Childhood. Now, such a regime, I would argue, may deliver you a compliant worker who accepts flexibility. And what flexibility means, by the way, when you talk to employers is turn up on time, do what you're told, and don't complain. But will that enable you to know what to do when the chips are down? I don't think so. All you've done is you've conditioned somebody to act, behave, in a socially acceptable way. You haven't equipped them for reasoning about why they should do that. I think that is fundamentally mistaken. Now, to make some progress, we need to do a little bit more philosophical analysis. 
So we're going to turn to an English philosopher whose name is Richard Peters, um, who was an educational philosopher. And Peters um, argued that we could divide virtues, and I think that's the best German translation I can come up with, can be divided into at least two groups. So what we're talking about when we're talking about the cultivation of humanity is what Socrates would have talked, or even Confucius would have talked about as the cultivation of virtue. So Peter says there's one group of virtues, things like honesty, tidiness, punctuality, which are not motives for action. Right? These do not involve moral reasoning. They are things that are conditioned into us that it actually it's important that you turn up on time, that you're tidy, and that you're honest. And they're context-dependent because it depends upon the regime of rewards and punishments about the extent to which you are honest, tidy, and punctual. And anybody who's got children knows that is the case. Trying to get the teenagers to tidy their bedrooms is just a nightmare. <laughs> and I'm glad my children are no longer teenagers. On the other hand, he says things like gratitude, prudence, and compassion are motives for action. These form the basis for moral reasoning, which is what we wish to develop in young people through education. They contain within themselves reasons for action. Now, I have the great pleasure of being the chair of governors of the University of Cambridge Primary School. And one of the things that we have is a values-rich curriculum. We want the children to learn about gratitude, prudence, and compassion. And the way we start them off, and we're talking about four-year-olds here, the way we start them off is actually to say please and thank you. But that's more like Peter's first group of virtues. They learn to say please and thank you, but are they really being grateful? Because what we noticed when we did a research project in the school using my undergraduates was that they only said please and thank you when the adults were around. <laughs> when they were in the playground, they didn't do that. So gratitude is much more than please and thank you. And uh, again, it's a really difficult concept, but it's the kind of thing that we are trying to instill in young people, that they behave with gratitude. Because gratitude provides you with a source of moral reasoning. So I would argue it's that latter group that we must be most concerned with as um, they underpin the vocation of being a citizen, of becoming more human. The problem is that when I go to workplaces and I talk with employers, it's the first group that's being emphasized, not the second group. I'm particularly struck by the concept of flexibility, which is described in the UK as being a general skill. Flexibility may indeed be a skill if you're a ballet dancer, but what employers actually mean when they talk about flexible workers is people who'll turn up on time, do what they're told, and not complain too much. That's not a skill, that's compliance. Okay, so we're gonna stick with that notion of we're trying to develop these really difficult things like respect and gratitude and compassion. And I would particularly stress compassion given what's happening in Europe at the moment around the migrants. So, for Martha Nussbaum, the cultivation of humanity is the essential function of education. And if you read that book, and I really do encourage you to read it, if you haven't read it already, you will see that her argument is based primarily around education in the arts and the humanities. Now, what we saw last night with those fantastic young people putting on various uh, shows for us was the power of art to actually enable young people to develop as human beings. I don't know what's happening in the general curriculum in the schools in Austria, but I can tell you arts and humanities are being downplayed in the general curriculum of the schools of England at the moment. 
uh, it, so because all that matters is science and mathematics. What absolute rot. What rubbish. Unless we educate young people in the arts and the humanities, they will not become more human. But in my experience, many students who've opted for a vocational education and training route would find studying the arts and the humanities a very odd thing to do. There was a tradition in England in the 1960s that apprentices, when we had a mass apprenticeship system, would be released for one day a week, typically one day a week, to go to a further education college. And it was mandated by law that part of that one day a week was to study the arts and the humanities. And what that meant in practice is they were given a book to read. Um, and there's a wonderful um, apocryphal novel by a, a, a writer called Tom Sharp called Wilt, and Tom Sharp was an FE college lecturer like I was, um, where he describes trying to teach what he calls Meat Three, who are the apprentice butchers, uh, the novel Jane Eyre. And as you can imagine, these young men were not particularly interested in Jane Eyre. So I don't think actually having mandatory arts and humanities as part of a VEC curriculum is necessarily going to be the solution here. But I was struck by what we saw last night and the enthusiasm with which those young people participated in music and dance and drama. So achieving the cultivation of humanity through VET, I think, is going to be quite challenging. To make some progress, I want to go back to an even older philosopher, and that's Confucius. Now, Confucius in the Analects distinguishes a particular characteristic, uh, and excuse my Mandarin, it's not that good, it's Ren, which is translated into English as humaneness. And he says, the essence of being human was wishing to be established himself seeks also to establish others. Do you see the personal and the social? Wishing to be enlarged himself, he seeks also to enlarge others, the personal and the social. He's talking about Bildung and Beruf. It wasn't invented in Germany at all. It was invented in China two and a half thousand years ago. Okay. So let's now turn to a European sage. You all, you all know who that is, it's Karl Marx. And Karl Marx, of course, said there is a spectre haunting Europe. It is called Brexit. <laughs> this is the elephant in the room, as the English would say. I had to bring it up at some point. Okay. Um, I'll tell you now that this is a disaster. Mrs. May's cabinet is trying to discuss what the new customs union is going to be with the European Union today. And I can already he hear Michel Barnier saying, no. Um, this, is the this is the antithesis, actually, of what Confucius is talking about. Um, I did not vote for this. And actually, if it happens, I will be leaving the UK because I will no longer wish to live there. So if anybody's got a job, I'll be looking for a job <laughs> next year. <laughs> okay, the real spectre I want to talk about is the spectre of competence. Now, competens does not translate into the English competence. It's more like capability. And even that doesn't really do it justice, but let's stick with it for the moment. That concept, I think, is a really useful concept for when you're talking about designing and assessing VET provision. I don't dispute that at all. It works well for the sorts of concrete tasks which are undertaken um, at work. But if you stretch it too far, and I did hear it being stretched in my view way too far yesterday evening, it becomes meaningless because it becomes everything. It's rather like the word skill in English. Skill, when we talk about skillful people in English, what we're really talking about is people who are doing things really well with their hands, whether that's actually producing pieces of fantastic furniture or whether it's actually writing a novel with a pen or a computer. It obviously involves thought processes, but what you observe is people doing things with their hands. 
But that word, skill, has now become so stretched, it's supposed to cover everything. So the word flexibility is now a skill. No, it's not. It really isn't a skill. So we need to be careful about the way that we use words. And one of the things I think we need to urge colleagues to do is to think hard about the way that we use the word competence. Competence. This word will not help us in thinking about educating young people so that they become more human. It's not that kind of a thing that we are trying to achieve. Hello, what's happened there? Ah. So I want to question whether we can really express the cultivation of virtue as competence. Should we be focusing on the outcome or should we be focusing on the process? And I think it's the process that we need to focus on because becoming human is never ending. It's a lifelong activity. There is no end to it. We can't say, oh, now you're a fully formed human being. It's not like that. It's not that kind of a thing. You can't, you know, you can say, yeah, you're a, com you're a competent cabinet maker, but you wouldn't say you're a competent human being. That would be very odd. All right, so we need to be careful about the words that we use to talk about the things that we wish to achieve as educators. So to make some progress, and I have to say, to actually fully answer the question I'm interested in is going to require me to write a very big book. Okay, and that's going to take me a little while. So I'm on a journey here, and I'm really grateful for Franz Gramlinger asking me to do this, because it's really made me think um, in a way that I haven't had to think for many, many years, because I've been a head of a faculty, and all you do is firefight as a head of a faculty. <laughs> you don't have to think, you just have to deal with the issues that you're confronted with. Um, so this has really made me think, I only have 11 more months as the head of the faculty in Cambridge, and then I go back to being an academic professor again, and then I'll write this big book. <laughs> so this is the groundwork for a big book. So I'm going to go back to this man again. I keep coming back to John Dewey. He's probably the most important philosophical influence in my life. Uh, I think he said so many um, really important things in education, normally in a very, very bad way. You have to interpret his writing. It's not easy. Um, but he's easier than Hegel. Um, and um, he's really, really important. And he said two things which I think are really, really helpful for thinking, helping us to think about what this process of helping young people to become more human through VET might look like. First of all, education is life itself. He didn't want to separate education from life. So what that's telling us, I think, is that this development of humanity in young people, humaneness, is about using the experiences of their lives and getting them to think and reflect on those experiences. The second uh, example is notoriously more powerful than precept. The interpretation of that is actions speak stronger than words, is if you try and sit down, young people down and give them a lecture about being good, it's not going to be very effective. What you need to do is to work with their actual behavior and get them to think and reflect on that. And in, in my experience as an FE college lecturer, that was something I had to do all the time, particularly with the young men in my classroom who had an extraordinary capacity for being misogynous. The way they talked about young women was quite appalling. And we challenged them every single time it happened. And we saw that as a really important part of our job as teachers, to get them to think hard about the things that they were actually doing and saying about young women. So that's a starting point. So we have to think about the nature of the experience that we design for young people through our VET program. And the second influence, I'm going to take from, another, from an English philosopher whose name is Michael Oakeshott. He's actually a political philosopher, but he did write an awful lot about education. And he said this, education involves a specific transaction 
which may go on between the generations of human beings in which newcomers to the scene are initiated into the world they are to inhabit. What he's doing is he's alerting us to the importance of more experienced, older individuals in the process of cultivating humanity. He's saying that learning in a community of learners is the older people who are really, really important. And I want to give you an example of that because I'm not necessarily talking about teachers. So this uh, example comes from a Danish production school. Danish production schools are um, schools which are independent of the state. They're run by the local community and they're intended for young people who have dropped out of ordinary schooling. And I was in this Danish production school one day and a group of young people um, were having lunch together. And three new students arrived and they were all wearing caps. And the older students who'd been there for a while said, we don't do that. We don't wear caps inside the building. And it was the older students who were helping the new students to be initiated into the life of that community. We also do that in the primary school that I'm the chair of governors of because when the children have lunch there, we quite deliberately put the older children with the younger children. And it's the older children that help the younger children to understand the rules of the game. So that notion of mixing people up of different ages and different experiences, I think may be a really, really important component of learning how to be virtuous. And certainly the work of Lawrence Kohlberg, who is the key person in terms of moral education, would suggest that that is the case. I'm almost finished. I really like this African proverb. It takes a whole village to raise a child. It tells us that this task of helping young people to become more human is all of our responsibilities. As educators, that is what we are responsible for. And I think there are three components to the task that faces us. First of all, we have to develop moral reasoning. It's not enough just to get children to obey the rules. Things like gratitude and respect and compassion involve moral reasoning. But moral reasoning is not enough unless you get moral behavior as well. And there is a dialectic going on between moral reasoning and moral behavior. I really like that Hegelian concept. Hegel talks about education being a process that negates the self. He says it should take you out of, your, take it, take you out of yourself and challenge you. It should make you feel uncomfortable because that's the way that you learn and develop as a human being. That's the dialectic. And then, then we need a bridge. We need a bridge to join the moral reasoning to the moral behavior. And I think that's moral climate. It's about the way that we organize our schooling, and it's a way that we organize the work when, for example, young people are doing apprenticeships. And I just want to tell you one more anecdote. One of my research students um, did a fantastic project. We were interested in, it in how the learning in higher education transferred into the workplace, because all of human capital theory assumes that is the case. Um, the evidence we have is that it doesn't transfer very well at all. Um, it makes you wonder why people are doing degrees, but then they're doing it for other reasons. Um, and, and what Natalie was doing is she was looking at young people who were going from a university that I'm no longer supposed to talk about because it isn't Cambridge. Um, and they were going to do internships over the summer in an investment bank. And they were actually working with the investment bankers and they were doing um, things like writing reports for them. And the way they learnt was, was horrific. So these were very, very clever young people. I mean, they are really seriously clever. So the first time they're asked to write a report on, say, coconut oil, yeah, a commodity which is being traded, um, they write what, what they would do if they were writing something for me. They write an essay. 
and they should give their essay to their supervisor who takes one look at it, throws it back at them and says, do it again. And that's it. But what we learnt from the work that Natalie was doing was that this investment bank was a totally amoral place. In fact, in some ways, it was immoral. And that's not what I mean by a moral climate. You cannot learn to be a human being in that kind of a climate. And I think a great challenge is about the conversations that we have to have with employers about the kind of environment in which you construct inside firms where apprentices are learning, which enables them to become more human. So, as I said, I found preparing this lecture an immense intellectual challenge, not least trying to understand the meaning of the words beruf and bildung. But there are clearly more challenges ahead and that I need to address in the future. For me, I need to learn as a matter of urgency more German, more French, more Spanish and more Italian so I can come and work in Europe. But I also need to learn more German so I can actually read the originals of um, these great German philosophers. Um, I hope I have um, at least produced some controversy, and I hope there's some issues to discuss. Vielen Dank. Many, th many thanks for this inspiring, in some parts educating, and maybe controversial talk. <laughs> so, feel free to address your questions to Professor Hayward in English. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, Alexander Schmölz, um, Austrian Institute for Research on Vocational Training uh, I, and University of Vienna. Uh, yesterday we've talked a little bit about the political toilet seats um, and, and the notion of policy. Um, could you go more into detail which kind of policy might help to foster this moral climate in schools? Mm. This yeah. is one. And of course I want to thank you um, for establishing the notion of vocational training in a truly humanistic sense, and always, uh, it's always a pleasure to me to hear people destroy Skinner. It, it still happens. Thank you. <laughs> there was um, a very famous British zoologist, and I am going to answer your question, but I'm going to come to it in a roundabout way, called Thomas Huxley who, when he read The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, was reported to have said, how very stupid not to have thought of that before. When I see policy, and I look at policy a lot, particularly, obviously, English policy, what I see policymakers doing all the time is saying, look at this fantastic new innovation. I saw it yesterday when that slide from Finland about Finland went up. That's not new. That was invented in England in the 1970s. It was called pre-vocational education. That's, it's not a new idea. And that's what I'm seeing all the time in policy, is that we're being told policy is a new idea, but actually it's not. It's the same idea endlessly repeated again and again and again. And you particularly see that in neoliberal countries, like, like the UK, for, for complicated reasons, which I don't have the time to go into, but I'm quite happy to talk over a cup of coffee about it. Um, what would help in terms of policy in education to develop humanities is for policymakers to stop making policy <laughs> and to trust teachers. That's what I think would help. Um, it would also help if policymakers stopped producing accountability systems for teachers, which means that they teach to the test rather than teaching the children who are in front of them to do the best that they possibly can. So I think those two things. But I think the most important thing is for educational policy makers to stop making educational policy for a while and let the whole system, in my country at least, calm down and let teachers get on with their job 
in terms of actually understanding the children in front of them, what those children need, and actually how they can help them to develop as human beings. Because we have forgotten that. We think the purpose of teaching is to enable young people to pass tests. And it's far, far more than that. Passing tests is important, but nonetheless, teaching as a job is far, far more than simply getting to your children to, te to pass tests. And the world has become obsessed with it. Largely, it's the fault of PISA. Um, but you know, the way that policymakers use PISA is so statistically naive that actually they should be stopped from doing it. Uh, I think Andreas Schleicher has got a lot to answer for. Does that answer the question? Stop making policy. Let teachers get on with their jobs. Lorenz, last thing. Yes, I agree very much with much what you say, but I have a problem with one point. Uh, this is the relationship uh, of taking Dewey and his reasoning about democratic education to the old German humanistic thinkers who definitely thought in a society which was not democratic. And I think that we have a similar discourse you uh, make here in, in Austria with some philosophers. And, and I think uh, that this, uh, going back to this uh, anti-democratic uh, anti reasoning makes uh, education very much um, uh, to be traced in an individualistic direction and in fact uh, forgetting to think about what it means to have democratic education. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. I, th I, I, I expected you would come up with something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence and I have know, known each other for a very long time. Um, I don't think I am going back to those old German philosophers to bring forward their thinking into the way that we need to think. What I was using them for was an attempt to trace the origins and development of the concept of Bildung, and I think you have to go through those German philosophers. And Dewey is clearly heavily influenced by Hegel. Uh, he, he is in many ways a Hegelian. Um, but I agree with you 100%. Um, it's not just about being citizens, it's about being citizens in democracies that actually matters. But of course, a lot of children are not growing up in democracies. So we have a particularly interesting challenge in my faculty at the moment. Um, we are doing an awful lot of work in Central Asia in those post-Soviet countries supporting educational reform and innovation. And we've been doing a huge amount of work around teacher training in Kazakhstan in particular. And Kazakhstan calls itself a democracy, but when 97% of the people vote for the president, you worry about that kind of concept. And one of the things that we are now turning our attention to is this moral aspect of education. Because the Kazakhs in inherited that Russian system that I talked about that Uri Bromfenbrenner um, designed. Um, and what these post-Soviet countries are trying to do is actually to move away from that, that Russian system. But that involves really interesting conversations with the teachers about what the role of the teacher actually is in terms of cultivating citizens who are going to live in a democracy. So I think the place we have to start is with initial and continuing teacher education so that teachers don't just become good at teaching their subjects, but they also become good or become better at cultivating humanity. And I think having that philosophical understanding is really, really important. Um, though, of course, we would not wish to bring forward the rather elitist views that were developing in non-democratic times in Germany in, into the forward. But nonetheless, the thinking of those great Germans, romantic philosophers, I think is important, and people do need to understand it. My name is Georg Daphner, I'm a member of the program committee. First of all, thank you very much for this great presentation. I had the honor four years ago to stay at the same place where you are staying and giving a keynote more or less about the same topic. And what I try to say is exactly what you said, that building, building is much more than competence. But unfortunately, we misunderstand 
Bildung as competence. So what we are doing is to standardize, to measure, but Bildung as such can never be measured. And that was actually the whole or the main message, the core message that I tried to give. And I got very positive reactions, but I also got one reaction I will never forget. One person in the audience told me, oh, Mr. Daphne, you're just naive. So this is what I would like <laughs> to ask you. What would you answer to someone who is telling you this is just naive? I'd rather be naive than instrumental. <laughs> um, the, the, there's nothing wrong with measuring things. I'm, I'm a statistician. I measure things all the time. Yeah? Um, but I recognize there are certain things I, I want to understand more about, and there are certain things I want young people to learn, which in many ways you can't measure. Uh, and if you do try to measure them, you kill them. You kill them stone dead um, because you reduce something which is holistic and really complicated to a, si to a list, a, a tick series of tick boxes. And, and, and you destroy what Durkheim would have called the organic solidarity of the very concept that you're trying young people to get. Um, and that's the challenge of being a teacher. How do you help young people to learn certain things when you can't assess them through a test? That seems to me to be a huge challenge. And if, that's, and, and if recognizing that challenge and doing something about it is naive, then I'm all for being naive. I th as I said in that last slide, there are challenges ahead. I don't pretend this is easy at all. It's very difficult. It's quite easy to write down a list. We do it all the time. We write these lists about general competencies or general skills, and they're meaningless. They are utterly meaningless because the things that we're talking about very often are not skills and they're not competencies. Right? They, are, they are either attitudes or personality traits or virtues, and that is not a competence. Being virtuous is not a competence. Does that answer the question? So be, being naive is better than being instrumental. 